if, if I have a tiger, uh, because I think I should own a tiger, I know it's illegal and <laughs> wildly impractical, but if I own a tiger and like I raise a tiger from a cub and like he's eating out of my hand and he's tame, like um, he's still a tiger. Uh, welcome to the Bible Study Discussion Podcast. My name is Wayne Charles Rosinski, and I'm here with... <laughs> I am Cindy Avignoni, his mom-in-law. It's true. She still is and will be for as long as time exists. <laughs> I don't know how it works in the new creation, but <laughs> but as long as I'm in charge of it. Uh, we are we are all the way to James chapter 3. We are reading and discussing and studying the Bible one chapter at a time. And I'm going to pray first, and then we'll dive on in. Sounds good. Heavenly Father, I love you. Thank you for your love and for your grace. God, thank you for a chance to read and discuss your word today. Would you open our hearts and our minds to learn more about you so that we may live a life that brings you glory and shows your love to those around us. Yes. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Very nice. Well, we are starting here in James 3. I'm going to read from 1 through 12. Long, long paragraph, if I can get it up here. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, since you know that we will be judged more severely. For we all stumble in many ways. If someone does not stumble in what he says, he is a mature man who can bridle his whole body. If we put a bit into a horse's mouth to make it obey us, we control its whole body as well. And think of a ship. Although it is huge and driven by strong winds, Yet the pilot can steer it wherever he wants with just a small rudder. So, too, the tongue is a tiny part of the body, yet it boasts great things. See how a little fire sets a whole forest ablaze. Yes, the tongue is a fire, a world of wickedness. The tongue is so placed in our body that it defiles every part of it, setting ablaze the whole of our life, and it is set on fire by hell itself. For people have tamed and continue to tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures, but the tongue no one can tame. It is an unstable and evil thing, full of death-dealing poison. When we bless Adonai, the Father, and with it we curse people who were made in the image of God, out of the same mouth come blessing and cursing. Brothers, it isn't right for it to be this way. A spring doesn't send forth both fresh and bitter water from the same opening, does it? Can a fig tree yield olives, my brothers? Or a grapevine figs? Neither does salt water produce fresh. The tongue is evil. Evil, evil. Uh, he starts with not many should become teachers. Um, as one who has preached and teached, I always enjoy reading that. <laughs> yeah. uh, the sort of judgment, but there, there is that responsibility on those who are teaching, regardless of what you're teaching, but especially uh, scripture, as we do our best to help people follow Jesus, to try and just be um, be sure of the things we say and be uh, careful of the words we use and, and how we live. Um, and then I, uh, verse two, part of verse two jumped out at me because he starts with, for we all stumble. And I think there are... Um, some preachers and Bible teachers who would probably want you to believe that they're pretty close to perfect. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, James, scary. in Scripture, um, starting with, the, for we all stumble, uh, I, I really enjoy a, a leader of the early church writing this letter and admitting that we all stumble, not you all stumble. Right. Um, so those are two things that I enjoyed before we got to the tongue. And then we spend uh, some verses talking about the tongue set on fire by hell itself. Yeah, it, uh, again, like we talked about last week, this is all part of one letter. It wasn't, it wasn't mm -hmm. split up. So when he talks about we stumble in many ways, we're still going back to f our faith and our works. We stumble in our works. We right. sometimes... Those of us that have been in the church a long time, like me, can remember back to like the 70s when um, Pentecostal churches, well, there were a lot of Pentecostal churches that were already doing this, but like our church had been a Baptist church, hmm. a staunch Baptist church, no tongues, no nothing. And then our pastor got 
just as he was driving one day, the Holy Spirit went zot, and he started speaking in tongues. And it just started a whole big thing to casting out demons in church. I mean, it went way overboard. Mm -hmm. We all stumble in many ways. How many of us have had teachings that we now realize were not exactly right? Mm -hmm. Because teachers are not perfect. It's like, um, you know, it says... Not many of you should become teachers because we will be judged more severely. We need to have grace for our teachers Mm -hmm. and mercy. And those of us that are teachers that have been, and for me, I think it's those that are called to teach. Um, If you can't, if you just absolutely love studying and then can't hardly keep it to yourself and need to get it out there, Mm. then you've been called to teach. I think both of us have been called to that. Mm -hmm. If you're not called to being a teacher and you just want to get up there for the glory, Mm. it's like being an actor on the stage. You just want the adulation of... Of you know being up there on a stage, but it also says we'll be judged more severely. We are kind of on a stage mm-hmm. because we're we're putting ourselves out there with not just the Bible teaching, but who we are, how we interpret that teaching. Right. So please give us grace if we mess up. Please let us know, uh, but nicely. <laughs> nicely. 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 One little word. We you know. Going into the tongue, oh my gosh, one little word can do a world of hurt mm-hmm. or teach a false doctrine. Right. You know, our, our tongue, sometimes our, I know for me, sometimes my tongue can run away with me before my brain actually engages and mm. I have to apologize. This is, this is a big part. I have a whole teaching called Ouch Christianity. And this, is, this part of it is a big part of it for me because I talk fast. I don't always think as fast as I talk, hmm. and so I have to, I have to go back and make sure that I'm doing it right because our speech. Hallie also, this is another the same um, commentary that I really like. Says our speech expresses our personality more than anything else, hmm. and that we need to be like like Jesus. In John 17, 16, Jesus says, "My teaching isn't mine, but it comes from the one." Who sent me? Hmm. Mm-hmm. We need to realize that those of us that that teach, it's not it's not my words, it's not my teaching. I didn't write this book. Right. Jesus wrote this book, mm-hmm. and we need to be. I need to be like him when I teach. Um, Beth Moore again, who I really like her whole study on James. If you. Like Beth Moore, you should study this study. Um, She says, keep a check on your motives. Those of you that want to teach, she's talking about. Keep check on your motives, stick to the scriptures, and ask God to give you the supernatural capacity to love those listeners more than you love your own skin. Hmm. Uh, I think that's really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that James uh, compares the, the size of the tongue to the... The rudder on a ship in the, a small fire, uh, and just um, throughout Jewish history, lots of talk about the tongue. Uh, Proverbs eighteen twenty one says, "Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit." Other proverbs about how we say and what we say them, and then uh, the psalmist uh, in Psalm one forty one verse three says, "Lord, set a guard for my mouth; keep watch at the door of my lips." Like I said, it's really easy to not always be that thoughtful about the words that we are saying. Uh, sometimes when you're teaching and you have time to like think about those words for quite a while before, it's, uh, it can be easier. Um, but uh, we live life with humans and sometimes humans make us mad and sometimes <laughs> sometimes the mad comes out uh, while the guard for the mouth is asleep. It's true. Yeah, Proverbs says also, keep lies and liars far from me. It's hard to keep a guard on our tongue all the time. Mm -hmm. We all stumble, just like he says, we are all going to stumble. We're all going to mess up. We just have to realize that and think that our words matter. I mean, you think about wars. Most all wars are started by words. You You say something to somebody and they throw down the gauntlet, either back in medieval times, it was a real thing. Nowadays, it's just a, 
you offended me, therefore I'm going to start a war or I'm going to do something bad back to you. Hmm. Um, it, it's We need to be really careful. In, in verses 9 through 12, James jumps from, well, he said it at the beginning, but he jumps from you. All, most of in the last couple chapters, he's been saying you, right. you, you. Now he jumps to we. Mm-hmm. James was a teacher and, and Something that I was thinking, when I'm most passionate in my teaching, it's usually something I struggle with myself. Mm -hmm. Maybe James did, too. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why he wrote so much of this on the tongue. Uh, From all accounts, James was a pretty, most of the time, kind of a pretty even-going guy. Mm -hmm. But apparently, he had trouble with his tongue, too, or he wouldn't be saying all of this stuff about the tongue and that words matter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The power of life and death. And he says, yeah, we use to uh, bless God and to curse people made in his likeness. Mm. Uh, the same tongue. Um, and then, yeah, I think sometimes when when we read these verses, we, we stop at how we talk. Uh, in Matthew 12, Jesus talks about how out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks and that the the things we say are, are like you said just generally an overflow of <laughs> who we are and a question yeah. I wrote down there because he talks about uh, grapevines and figs is is what are we cultivating like in our lives in our in our uh, quiet times with the Lord in our Bible study in our reading like what are we cultivating in our heart that will come out out the mouth with the tongue. That's funny. That's one of the things that I put down to is Matthew twelve thirty four. From out of the heart, the mouth speaks, because that is very convicting to me. You know, something that I've said. Why? Why did I say that? Did I? I I didn't think that I was harboring that in my mm. heart. I didn't think that I was trying. I'm not trying to hurt somebody with what I say, but sometimes it. It comes out out of frustration. Right. Um, sometimes we don't even realize we are. Sometimes we think we know that we are, and we bottle it down. Mm-hmm. Instead of sitting down with somebody and saying, hey, I'm having a problem with this, or even just praying about it and saying, okay, God, it's not that big of a deal. I don't want to go to this person, but I need you to change my heart. Mm, like right. David said, change my heart, oh mm-hmm. God. You know, how many words matter? How many broken relationships have been caused by words. How much prejudice is is caused by our words? And out of the heart, the mouth speaks. But then on the other side of this, look at Acts 2. Hmm. You know, words were used for good. God right. used God used tongues, yes, to speak to everybody, but he used Peter's words. Right. He gave words to Peter in those tongues mm-hmm. to speak to everybody, and it cut them to the heart because right. they were good words. So we're not, it, this is not just a bad chapter. It's not just telling us, oh, you screwed up over and over and over mm-hmm. and what you said. It's also talking about our words can be used for good. Right. We can build somebody up instead of tearing them down. We can tell them, hey, you look really good today. Just a small thing every day, try to think of somebody, something that you can say to somebody. Maybe the grocery store clerk who looks like she's really tired. Hey, you okay? Right. Hey, you look good today. Hey, I'm really happy to see you today. Mm-hmm. These kinds of things build us up. Just just simple little words. Right, like, hey, them kicks is dripping. <laughs> Which I think four years ago meant that I liked your shoes. <laughs> It's not cool anymore, I'm sure. I don't think I've ever heard that one. No, it's it's something. Um, I love the just the, rem, the reminder. Um, he talks about taming animals, and um, and it says no man can tame. Like if if I have a tiger, uh, because I think I should own a tiger. I know it's illegal and wildly <laughs> impractical. But if I own a tiger and like I raise a tiger from a cub and like he's eating out of my hand and he's tame like um he's still a tiger though. Like I can I can never not treat him like a tiger. Right. As as tame as he is, as used to me as he would become over years, he is still a tiger. Like, I can never just walk with him unleashed down the road. Right. Because he's still a tiger. Right. And, like, no matter how much work we've done on, on our heart and our tongue, like, still evil, still need to continue to treat it like it's dangerous. 
We can't just become like it is and be like, oh, it's okay. I've tamed this. It's it's no longer got any evil in it. Like it's still a tiger, and I still need to to be aware of that. Um, N.T. Wright in his commentary says, what James is after then is consistency. He wants people to follow Jesus through and through to be blessing only people rather than blessing and cursing people. It's a high standard, but we should expect no less if the gospel is indeed the message of salvation. Mm. And I find that uh, challenging and encouraging. That's true. You know, it talks about if we were able to tame our tongue, we would be mature. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, we can't completely tame our tongue, just like you couldn't completely tame a tiger. It's still a tiger. Our Mm -hmm. tongue is still evil, just like our heart is evil and wicked. Mm -hmm. But we can become becoming mature, continually working on it. The Holy Spirit uses our tongue. Um, it's, It's His instrument to magnify God, Mm -hmm. to praise God. Paul says, pray without ceasing. Yes, we can pray in our spirit. We can Mm -hmm. sit and pray quietly. But he's talking about praying out loud, Mm -hmm. using our tongue for good, Mm -hmm. using our tongue to magnify the Lord. Indeed. Anything else before we turn the page? Nope. All right. It's a digital page, but it's still a page. it counts. <laughs> Mine has a page, but it and doesn't just like turn. Listening to audio books counts as reading. If you don't agree with me, let's fight in the comments. <laughs> um, I will read uh, chapters thirteen through the end of the so chapters verses thirteen <laughs> through the end of the chapter. <laughs> Who among you is wise and understanding? By his good conduct, he should show that his works are done in the gentleness that comes from wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without pretense. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate Peace. Hmm. That is a whole lot. That is a whole lot. We're back to wisdom. Yep. From the very beginning of, of being told that we can ask God for his wisdom. And then James talks about the wisdom of the world. Earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Wow. Selfish, bitter. Those feel like things to avoid. It, it, I think of, of Proverbs, you know, the fear of God is the beginning mm-hmm. of wisdom. Just learning how, who God is, learning his nature, um, literally fearing what, it, you know, the Bible also says, don't fear those who can kill your body, but fear right. who can kill your soul. Who, the only one that can do that is, is Jesus, is the Father in, in judgment. And I think we just need to learn that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Hmm. Just learning who he is is just the beginning. Right. Those are, you know, Paul talks about in, in some of his stuff, um, what we think of as great spiritual truths. And he says, this is for babies. This is your, this is the stuff you should have learned already. Hmm. Mm-hmm. We need to understand that we are continually learning. Mm-hmm. Even if we're just learning as babies, we can't stay there. Right. We can't just say, oh, I've got this truth down. I'm right. done. Yep. No. We're, we're never going to be done in this life. Mm. We will be continuing. The older I get, the more I realize that I don't know, mm-hmm. that I need to be continually learning mm. and, and learning wisdom. Right. And that's scary that he says, you know, the wisdom of man is, is demonic. It's not just our thoughts. It's mm. worldly, unspiritual. Ah, we harbor in our hearts bitter jealousy, selfish ambition. Wow, that God forgive us. Yeah. You know, help me to I know there are times when I'm this thought'll jump in my head. Now that doesn't mean that that's sin mm-hmm. when when a thought jumps in your head. If you think oh, I don't want to think that and you just go on and say, Oh God, no, no. Hmm. You're fine. But it's when you st- it's it's like when we talked about earlier when you think about that thought mm-hmm. and you keep thinking about that thought. Oh, I'm I'm 
I'm learning to be wise. I am wise in this. I don't, I am really good about this. Well, mm-hmm. then you keep doing that, you're going to end up in sin. We've got to remember to constantly be repentant, constantly be learning. Right. And there are there are people who um there are people who are very smart, and when they are preaching or teaching, come across as though they think they are very smart. Um, and, uh, yeah, I have a really hard time learning from people like that uh, because they come across as, as thinking they're very—and they're, like, I have no doubt that they're very smart and very studied, but they come across as if they know they're very smart and very studied. Right. And then there are people, um, Tim Mackey of The Bible Project— um, Incredibly wise person, but like when you listen to their podcasts, for most of their videos, they'll have multiple hours of conversation between Tim Mackey, who's very, very, very smart, and and John Collins, who's who's a smart guy, but asks the questions that more normal people would ask of Tim Mackey, and and even hearing Tim Mackey like preach and teach, and like knowing um, like how much he's studied and everything he's mm-hmm. done, he comes across relatable and personable, he does. and like he's like like this is what I've learned, and this is what I'm sharing with you. Um, yep. Instead of like, this is what I know and do my way. And uh, there are people who just come across as arrogant. And I, yeah, um, if I've we've had guest speakers in different churches like that, and they've come across that way. And then I spend a good 40 minutes doodling or exactly. or, or, they, or they mention a scripture. And I was, I was going to read what you're uh, teaching wrongly, <laughs> whether you're teaching like the wrong thing about it or teaching with the wrong attitude about it. I was like, I'm just going to read and study this, this scripture while I sit around all these people listening to, because like listening to you will not help me grow. No, we need to pray for those kinds of people. You know, they they may not realize this is, again, thinking of others as better than ourselves. They may not realize how they come across, especially, um, you know, very, very intelligent people don't always realize they have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is knowing what to do. Wisdom is how to do it. Mm-hmm. How to walk it out, under, the understanding of how to walk it out. They may have the knowledge, that, and, and they do. They have wonderful knowledge. Mm-hmm. But they don't have the wisdom to be able to break that down to the layman. Right. To, and they may not mean to come across as arrogant, but it does. Right. Because they don't take the time to, to learn Wisdom. Right. I think my favorite uh, knowledge and wisdom uh, quote was uh, that knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit and wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. <laughs> That's really good. I, I really like um, Psalm 119.11. I treasure your mm-hmm. word in my heart so that I won't sin against you. Right. And I think that's, a, that's another big difference between knowledge and wisdom. I can know that. I can read that verse and say, I treasure your word in my heart. Mm-hmm. It was great. That's a, that's a good verse. Mm-hmm. But if I don't apply the wisdom and the understanding to actually do that, how do I treasure that word in my heart? Mm-hmm. Well, it's by, by continually reading, mm-hmm. by praying, God, il- Holy Spirit, illuminate this part that I'm reading right now. Show me what it is you're speaking to me about this. I mean, most of us that have been in the Word a long, long time can read the same verse, like Proverbs. I read Proverbs every day or most every day. I'm not, you know, it's not something that I can always get to every single day. But I've been doing it for the last 15 years. You would think that I would have memorized Proverbs by now. (laughs) But no, I can look at that and think, because the Holy Spirit gives me different parts of it. Right. Different months. Mm -hmm. I mean, I read it every single month. There's 31 verses or chapters in Proverbs, 31 days of the month. So if you if you do read it, and which is a really good thing to do, by the way, God's going to give you something different Mm -hmm. every month that you read. He can show us different things based on what He wants to show us based on what we're going through and what we're facing those times. I think from from this part of James, it. Sounds like it's it's really easy to uh, speak truth and uh, more challenging and takes wisdom to speak truth in love. Uh, N.T. Wright says the challenge then for God's people 
is to be able to tell the truth about the way the world is and about the way wicked people are behaving without turning into a perpetual grumble. (laughs) And in particular, without becoming someone whose appearance of wisdom consists in being able to find a cutting word to say about everyone and everything. Oh, that's really good. That call to... To be able to say true things, to be able to say hard things in a loving and a gentle and a kind way. Um, and then, they, yeah, being sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. So even when we have uh, truths that are hard to say, things that we might disagree on, to be able to be a person who uh, comes at those disagreements with a uh, peaceful uh, attitude. That's really good. I, I really like that. I, I was... Reading this this one verse in, uh, where is it? Let's see, verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure, then peaceful, kind, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy, uh, which is what my version says. It reminds me of the fruit of the Spirit. It's yeah. got a list there that if you build on the fruit of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, you build on each one mm-hmm. of those. And I think the same thing is here. You're first of all, pure, mm-hmm. then peaceful, kind, and, and, and on and on as it goes. We need to build on our wisdom. We'll learn, we'll learn a certain thing about God. We'll learn a certain thing from the Scriptures, and right. then, then we need to meditate on that. You know, mull it over in our mouth. Speak it out. Mull it over in our mind. Think, okay, Holy Spirit, what is it you want me to learn from this one thing? What wisdom mm-hmm. can I extract from mm. Maybe this one little verse that I'm reading, maybe just this one little thing, you know, okay, first of all, pure. Well, how do I be pure? How do I be peaceful? Mm -hmm. Um, Peace, you know, verse 18, peacemakers who sow seed in peace. It's not just being peaceful. Mm -hmm. I can be peaceful in myself. I can sit at home and twiddle my thumbs and be peaceful. It's a quiet day. I can read. I can sing. I can... But... Sowing in peace means when you see discord, Mm -hmm. when you see disharmony, when you see somebody that's messing up. Right. Sowing peace, like you talked about, being able to speak something to someone that they need to hear, but with the right attitude Mm. and in peace. Um, There was way, way back when I was in high school, a friend of mine and his mom were just at each other constantly. And God gave me words for them. I said, you know, can I talk to you guys? And I was able to sit down and bring peace. Now, I didn't bring peace. The Holy Spirit brought the peace. But be able to say, you know, this is what he's really saying. This is what she's really saying. Because they couldn't see that. They were too Mm. much in the trenches. Sometimes it takes somebody else coming into our relationship and saying, hey, this is what this other person is thinking. This, it's mm-hmm. not what you think. Right. The, you know, most relationship books say when you're talking to your spouse, when you're talking to somebody, say, this is what I heard you say. Mm-hmm. Because so many times we don't hear right. Right. Yep. We, mm-hmm. a, and we end up going, oh, hey, that was, that was bad. That was a dumb thing. That mm-hmm. was, you know, because we don't go to the other person so many right. times and say, I think I might have heard you wrong. Mm-hmm. We need to do that. That's also sowing in peace. It doesn't yep. always take another person to do it. Right. But sometimes it does. Yep. I love, uh, yeah, well, sowing in peace by those who cultivate peace. Um, sowing and cultivating our action words in chapter two. We learn that our faith without works is dead. And here we are at the end of what we call chapter three with more of these action words that apply to how we are uh, following Christ, how we are living out that walk. And, and I love your reminder that it's, it's slowly over time. N.T. Wright says that uh, these, these fruit, they only appear where there has been a steady habit of prayer and self-discipline. Even then, they may take a while to show themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I bought, I bought an apple tree uh, two and a half years ago, and it had two apples on it the first year, and it had more last year. And it will continue, my guess, in, until it dies from mm-hmm. neglect. Um, which hopefully it won't because I, I love my apple tree. Um, <laughs> it will continue to have more and more fruit, but that is a, a process that takes time. I think sometimes we can uh, talk about faith and it, and it feels like it's something that we decide to follow Jesus and then we study the Bible and then we've arrived and, and we're there. We, <laughs> we know all the things and we live, we live it all perfectly. 
Um, and that that is a, a long, long <laughs> process uh, with ups and downs and lefts and rights and circles and squares. And, yep. Um, indeed. Anything else before we get to the big idea? Well, at the at the last one again in peacemakers, you know, it's it's again like you said, it's an action. It's mm-hmm. actively <laughs> sowing peace, promoting peace. Something that I had struggled with, and I and I still do to a certain extent, is do you need to have the last word? Do you have to be the one that that is always right? That's something that I've always struggled with. Yes, I've always <laughs> wanted to be the one that's right, and I think we all do. I think we all want to be the one that's right. But if we're actively working on it, I'm actively working on it, mm-hmm. of letting someone else have the last word, of saying it's that thing of going back to putting others first, putting, saying, you know, maybe your opinion is better than mine. Mm -hmm. And he talks about, you know, sowing peace and humility, being humble. That's one thing that I love about this church. That's one of the reasons that we decided to come here is that the leadership is so humble. Mm -hmm. I just love that. You had talked about, you know, leaders that get up and are arrogant. And again, sometimes they don't see that, but sometimes they aren't so humble. Right. Sometimes, and sometimes we can be proud. Mm-hmm. We, and the Holy Spirit is very good about telling us if, if, if we are actively promoting peace and actively saying, cleanse my heart, oh God, He is very faithful mm-hmm. to do that. And we, it, it's hard. It is. It, it's a hard, like you talked, it, sometimes it's a straight line. And I got from here to here and I did good. Mm-hmm. Most of the time it's I got from here to here years later because I went here and I went here and I mm-hmm. went here and I went here. It's not an easy walk. Right. You know, it, it's the narrow, what is it? The narrow way, not mm-hmm. the wide way. Right. And sowing peace is so important. Taming our tongue mm-hmm. is so important. That, that's my biggest thing about taking from this is taming the tongue is also being peaceful, hmm. is, is bringing about the peace that comes from the Father of lights, right. not the peace that not Jesus says, I give you peace, not as the world gives, right. but from the Father. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for me, my, my big idea, um, man, I underline cultivate peace. I think sometimes we uh, think of keeping the peace as not bringing up things that will cause conflict or, or just letting people walk over us. Um, but that, that cultivating peace is uh, like something that takes our action and something that takes work. Uh, I've never cultivated much land to try and get to grow things, but I imagine that that takes uh, labor. And labor every year in it's that true. field. Not a, I did it and I'm done, but I continue to cultivate <laughs> peace. So to, um, yeah, not just trying to stay out of the way and not let stuff bother you, but to actively sow and cultivate peace in those relationships. Right. Ready for a question from the cube? I suppose. Well, I so far they've been easy. I can reach it. Yeah, there's no math questions, so that's helpful. All right. I believe you get to ask first. <laughs> Everyone that I've asked you has been a whole bunch of different things, like the the clothes or the shoes right. or whatever, or your cars the first time. What are your favorite apps? My favorite. <laughs> a whole bunch of favorite those. My favorite APPs, my favorite applications. Um, I don't even know what you consider app. I feel like everything's an app. Uh, Adobe Premiere Pro, I would say, is, is a favorite uh, because I use it very often for the things that I do. Um Logos, my Bible software has an app mm. on the iPad, which I really love. And actually, I paid for Logos Bible software when I was going to school in Multnomah because the student discount was 50%. Nice. And that's a lot. And I thought, well, I don't like need this now. But if I ever need this, I should buy this now. Um, and for a long time, I didn't use it very much because it was just on the computer. And I just don't like reading for very long on the computer. Uh-huh. Like either sitting or standing at a desk. Uh, I, but... They have an iPad app and actually a web app that works on iPad as well. So uh, studying with the logo software on the iPad is just fantastic. Hmm. Uh, The Maps app gets me places. Yes. (laughs) I'm not Google Maps. I'm an iPhone guy and the Apple Maps app. uh, Yeah, I agree. may not be a better app, but it does (laughs) things that I appreciate. Um, And then I guess Audible. Audible. I listen to a lot of books, Hmm. especially uh, fiction books I don't uh, want to sit and read. I'll sit and read books that I want to learn from. 
Uh, but if uh, it's something that is fiction, I enjoy listening to that much, much more. <laughs> so currently listening through The Wingfeather Saga, again, by Andrew Peterson. Wonderful books. Those are my favorite applications. Cool. I think, currently. Okay. Uh, here, here's one. You only get one answer. What was your most memorable meal ever? Oh my it God. says ever. Like, what a question. Oh, boy. My most memorable meal ever? That is really hard. I feel like it should be easy because it's your most memorable one. <laughs> you would think it would be easy. <laughs> yeah, but, but there's, there's, a lot enough about them. Of, there's a lot of good memorable meals. I would have to say... I'm not a huge meat eater, but years and years ago when we lived in Alaska, there was a tiny Dutch restaurant, and they served filet mignon, and I'd never had filet mignon before. And it was a special occasion. I think it was our anniversary or something, so I decided to get filet. And I have to say that it was the first time I ever had it, and it was the best I have mm. ever had. I have had filet since then, and there's been a couple that have been really good, but that was amazing. Excellent. Well, I would love to know in the comments your most memorable meal ever and, and your favorite apps, mostly because I want to maybe start using your favorite apps and add them to my list of favorite apps. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us as we uh, read and discussed through the third chapter of the Book of James. We're over halfway done. Can you believe that? Wow. I can because I'm good at math. And three <laughs> is more than half of five. Anyways, thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. You can uh, like the video, share it with friends, with family, with your dog if you want to. And we'll see you later, alligator. Bye.